<clears throat> okay, I, I should have probably watched the episode uh, before to like get in the mood again. It's been a while since I've uh, I've recorded such an advertisement episode. Um, I guess welcome back. Um, oh yeah, doing things. Um, let's connect to lgl.zillihoon.com, which is a uh, anarchy server, um, a vanilla anarchy server, and yeah, I've not been playing here for quite some time. I think it was a um, few um, yeah weeks, a month. I don't know. Um, the thing is, <coughs> uh, I I already feared that the server won't survive uh, me not actively advertising for it and yeah it, it seems like it's actually like that and i will <coughs> most likely not um, be active for long here on the server and advertising it so if you're interested in playing on here and you don't want to be alone you have to bring your own friends um, <coughs> i don't really have a efficient um, advertisement set up oh and yeah i <coughs> reset my computer so a few things are not configured yet um, yes, I want that one. Oh, and there's a new version of Minecraft out. If um, you haven't noticed, it's all already. Um, yeah, it's almost not new anymore. Um, so the thing this uh, Anarchy server here offers for you is um, <coughs> not the greatest hardware or the most performing server or like most players or whatever even though the hardware is uh, quite fine it's not like um, yeah high-end um, overclocked whatever the best on the planet um, and it's mostly empty but it's a vanilla server which is uh, quite uncommon for a anarchy environment um, and that allows me to update and also the low player count allows me to update to the latest versions um, <coughs> which means that you can play in an anarchy environment without um, yeah, having to keep your client uh, in an outdated version which is the case for yeah, all the other servers that have like players and um, yeah, depend on a more stable version of Minecraft because the newer versions tend to get more unstable and unstable um, yeah so um, if that server interests you and um, you want to play on a server that is like mostly empty but uh, still online um, I mean the server won't go away just because there are no players um, then go check out Lasergroupment reachable under lgl.silihun.com and yeah today I um, prepared a video about a JavaScript from the JavaScript conference um, from Asia. Asia? Is it even in English? Wait, what did I prepare here? And the browser gets to decide when to do this. And it tries I think I've seen it already, but I, um, like the video that I think I've seen already, I could not remember, like I cannot remember like in detail enough, so it's probably worth a rewatch. Um, the thing is, this video is not licensed under Creative Commons on YouTube and the description states, uh, which I think is uh, cool that uh, um, the speakers hold the, the rights, um, so we are a little bit gambling here that um, the speaker, Jake Archibald, I don't know, um, is not going to sue us, and by us I mean me, um, <coughs> by replaying that video in the background. <coughs> So yeah, I think it's a cool idea to um, yeah to keep the the rights to the speakers, but um, I I also uh, think it would be an even cooler idea to like recommend the speakers um, to uh, use a permissive license um, and then upload it under this license on YouTube because what I feel is like there's no communication between the speakers and the conference at all, and it just like says it's a permissive li um, it's uh, not a permissive, it, like the right belongs to the speaker, but there's no communication with the speaker. So even if the speaker would um, allow like use of that um, content, um, he's not like actively asked or um, things like that. Um, I'm just assuming here, but I feel like this is how it's going. 
and um, I think most speakers, um, yeah, I know I'm just assuming here, uh, are grateful for people like watching their content and um, yeah, I mean, re-uploading content is like not the thing that they, they love, but um, it's not like that I'm stealing views here because people prefer to watch it on my channel um, because the original is in like better audio quality so I guess um, and better uh, you have even video in the original so I guess it's fine uh, for this case um, yeah as you might have noticed in previous episodes I'm usually quite um, yeah uh, I, how you how do you say in English um, I try to uh, not uh, like upset people by uh, using their content and what is the sound outside I have to close the window okay so with that being said I'm now going to watch a YouTube video from the YouTube channel um, JSConf uh, it's a video from 2018 and it has the title um, Jake Archibald in the loop um, JSConf.Asia It has 200,000 views and if you're interested in that content then um, make sure to check out the original as I already like um, mentioned it's uh, always cool to keep the um, views uh, to the original uploaders even though it's not the speakers channel it's like the official conference channel so um, I guess uh, they would appreciate that also if you have feedback to um, the video that I'm now going to play back make sure to uh, not write comments here because um, it won't uh, reach the speaker or uh, the conference or whatever okay and if you're interested in this Minecraft server if you want to play in an environment where you can like grieve uh, where you have vanilla a vanilla server where you are allowed to do a to do some things like um, griefing, killing other players, uh, using hacked clients and like try harding um, with uh, whatever like uh, utilities you can get um, to yeah achieve your goals um, yeah so um, that's that's about it for my introduction and I would say let's go play the video That kind of oh, this is already going well. If I get an applause for that, that's fantastic. Um, it's like I haven't like I, well, what do I know about the world? But I feel like Singapore is like the the most European Asia you can get, right? If that makes sense to you. I mean, as I saw Asia in the title, I thought it w would be like some. I don't want to sound rude, but like most like. Um, I think it's especially Chinese. I don't know. Like, what was it? This one DefCon in China that was quite um, intense um, regarding the um, English skills. Um, it's such a different language that it's uh, hard to understand. Uh, like, not all people, but um, uh, yeah, most. I don't want to say most, but. Um, you see more Chinese talks where it's hard to understand what they are talking um, than I would say European talks or whatever um, yeah but um, the English skills in Singapore are good I don't know why I'm even talking alright let's continue it's around yet like I, I landed just before the conference so I, I can't say I've really experienced it yet but I'm gonna stay on for a few days afterwards and you know and have a proper explore um, I well, I mean, other than that, he, he doesn't even seem to come from Singapore, but yeah. <laughs> partner along with me as well, uh, and I have to say that was a big mistake, a huge mistake. Because um, she's, she's been really looking forward to this trip, right? And especially over the last couple of weeks, she's been saying things like, oh, you know, two weeks till we go to Singapore, one week till we go to Singapore, five days to go, four days to go. And I'm like, could you, could you please not do that? Because what I'm hearing, right? 
is five days. You only have five days to finish your talk. Four days, three days, you're still not ready, are you? It's like the worst project manager ever, just like taunting me and how unprepared I am. But then, then, then she's brilliant, like, because she knows how to, she knows how to put up with me, because, because I stress, right? I, I stress pretty easily. Uh, I stress about things that aren't really problems. I stress about things that are really nothing to do with me. Um, someone posted this picture on Twitter last week. He's holding a MacBook between two fingers <laughs> above concrete. <laughs> I have not slept since I saw this picture. <laughs> I, I, I stress about code like this, right? Um, firstly, because there's no semicolons. Give me a cheer if you use semicolons in JavaScript. Yes. Good to hear. The rest of you are monsters. But that's not the main thing that stresses me out. It, it's because it's adding stuff to the DOM and then hiding it, like presumably to show it sometime later, like on click or something. And that stresses me out because it's like, uh, can we be sure that the user's not going to see like, a, a flash of that element before it's hidden? And, uh, and I've never been able to recreate this problem. I've never seen it happen, but I, you never know when it comes to race. I don't even know what I was about to do. Um, before I started the recording, I, I, ru I ran around a little bit and um, I seem to, I think I was like searching sand and I then like before the recording I placed all the sand, that's why I decided to farm it again. Mm. But I don't know where, where I even needed it for. That looks cool. Um, such, such a random bridge. Um, I guess I should uh, search the uh, bore. Oh, here's the border. We found it. That was easy. Okay. Yeah, I did that. Um, here, like here, uh, I left in the last recording, I think. It wasn't a recording. I used to live stream uh, when, uh, back then. <laughs> it's like. I don't, I have like actually no clue when the last time was I played here. Um, but looks like nobody filled up the thing yet, which is uh, good. So, yeah. Looks good to me. So I always just swap those lines around just so I can get some sleep. But really, there's no race condition here. Because the timing of running code and rendering is all, is all tightly defined and mostly deterministic. And that is thanks to the event loop. And if I do a half decent job in the next 30 or so minutes, you'll know why things run in the order they do. And I don't know, it might even make sense, but there's no promises there. So. Web pages have a thing that we tend to call the main thread. Here's the, here's the main thread. We call it the main thread because loads of stuff happens here. It's where JavaScript happens. It's where rendering happens. It's where the DOM lives. And this means that the bulk of your stuff on the web has a deterministic order. We don't get multiple bits of code running at the same time, like trying to edit the same DOM and, and giving you a world of, of horrible uh, race conditions. But it does mean that if something on the main thread takes a long time, and, and by a long time I mean like 200 milliseconds, that's a, a long time in terms of user interaction, then it becomes really noticeable because it's blocked loads of other things, like it blocks rendering, it blocks interaction. And I think it's difficult for us to think in this way because as humans we are extremely multi-threaded. Like I can stand here, I can wave one hand, I can stand on one leg, I can wave the other leg, and all the time I'm speaking, I'm breathing, I'm processing audio and visual information. As humans, we don't really have a main thread. We don't really have things that block unrelated things. I, I mean, we, we have one, and that is when we sneeze. <laughs> because as you begin to sneeze, just stuff shuts down, you know? Like, the first thing you lose is the ability to talk, uh, then you pull a stupid face, uh, if you're driving at this point, this is where you think, huh, I hope no one dies, least of all me. 
and then the human body becomes entirely single-threaded. Like you are sneezing, nothing else. You can't see, hear, think. You can move and make noises, but only in ways the sneeze wants you to. You have no control over this at all. <laughs> and, and then it's over, right? You, you essentially wake up and you find out if your car is still on the road, if you have the same number of limbs you started with, the same number of passengers you started with. Right? Needless to say, we don't want to write code that is like a sneeze. So although we have this, this main thread thing, we tend to spawn a whole series of threads, like the networking stuff, encoding and decoding, crypto, monitoring input devices. But once these threads have done something that the page needs to hear about, they need to sort of come back to the main thread to give it that information. And it's the event loop that orchestrates all of this. Like, take set timeout, for instance. Is it badly named? Yes. Are the arguments in the wrong order? I'd say so. But have you thought about how it actually works? Well, let's write a web standard for it, because that's what I do these days. We'll start with uh, a set timeout method when invoked must run the following steps. Wait MS milliseconds, invoke callback. Done. But this isn't quite working. Because spec text like this, this runs on the same thread as whatever invokes it. And in this case, it's invoked by JavaScript. So this is running on the main thread. So if we say wait 5,000 milliseconds, we are waiting 5,000 milliseconds on the, on the main thread. We're blocking lots of other stuff. So this spec is very sneezy right now. So we need to change that. And we do this. We run the steps in parallel, which is magic spec speak for get off the main thread or get off this thread and run this stuff kind of at the same time as other stuff. But we've created a new problem here because now we're invoking a callback from something other than the main thread. And I mean, there's no way this can really work. I mean, you would end up with lots of JavaScript running in parallel, still editing the same DOM, and you'd end up with all of these race conditions. So what we do is this, we queue a task and we queue a task to get back onto the main thread at some point. Um, and now we're calling JavaScript on the thread where JavaScript lives. Uh, so it all works. And this is a core part of how the browser works. Like, if you click the mouse, like how does that get from the operating system into your JavaScript? It queues a task. When you fetch something, how, how do you get the response into your JavaScript? Well, it queues a task. And you send the message from a page to a worker, once again, it queues a task to do that. So the first part of the event loop I want to look at task queues, and this is the oldest part of the event loop. Um, rather than look at the spec, uh, I thought it might be easier to try and visualize the event loop. So here it is. This, this is it. I hope that clears up any questions you have. Um, actually, I really hope it does, because I've based the whole talk around this one diagram, so I hope it works. But yeah, with, without anything to do, the event loop just spins round and round in a CPU-efficient manner. Now, this visualization is running at a fraction of a percent of real time, and it's still kind of too fast to really see what's going on. So let's slow things down a bit. When we queue a task, the event loop takes a detour. So this... The fuck is in the background of this talk? There's the screen and there's... Here, this detour here, this is where tasks happen. I don't get it. So at some point the browser says... Oh, we have actually player online here. That's so surprising. I, I really don't know how this works. I, I mean, I'm not even live. Is it like people stalking the... There's not even a server browser. I'm like, I don't get it. Like, why are people joining when I'm playing? Um, oh, I'm on this side. I, I somehow thought I'm on the other side. And I somehow thought that all my bases are raided by now. Um, but that's cool. All my stuff is still here. Um, I mean, we are like in the... 1000 uh, blocks uh, corner from spawn so that's like super close uh, but yeah that's what you get on a chilled energy server you get a chill even at spawn that's um, so nice um i feel like i i should go lower how high am i here like at 68 Um, yeah, maybe those people are coming like from server lists and you get ranked higher on the server lists if you have like one connected player. Um, yeah, because like um, usually when I check um, how many players are like here, not in my Minecraft client, but like in my tools that like monitor all the um, game servers I host, 
it says zero players and it said that like forever um yeah i don't feel like mining that thing away let me maybe build a, co a cannon that just yeah yeah i don't know what is going on server broken wow hey i've got a job for you to do and the event was like Excellent, okay, add it to my oh, to-do list. Oh, it's my connection. Look at this. Boy, why is it so bad? Round to it at some point. No problem, done. What if we do this? Using set timeout, we queue two callbacks that we want to run after one second, 1,000 milliseconds. Well, according to the spec we wrote, these two algorithms go parallel. Each waits for 1,000 milliseconds and then they need to come back onto the main thread and they do that by queuing a task. So, the browser says to the event loop, hey, I've got something here that wants to do main thread work. In fact, I have two things, and it adds each one as a separate to-do item uh, in the task queue. If the event loop's like, sure, that's fine, I'll get around to it. So it runs the first callback. Is that low enough here? It goes around the event loop. Do I even still know uh, how to bind those callback. machines, uh, to build those Enough machines? Tasks. Uh, and it would be pretty simple Let's try. if that's all it was, but it gets more complicated when we think about the render steps. And this is what the browser uses to update what's actually on the screen. Looks like. The render steps are another detour, and that involves style calculation. Um, this is looking at all of the CSS that's going on and working out what applies to each element. Uh, layout, this is creating a render tree, figuring out where everything is on the page um, and where it's positioned. And then creating the actual pixel data. Looks good you know, to me, right? Actual painting. So at some point, the browser will say to the event loop, hey, you know, we need to, we need to update what's on the screen. And the event loop's like, no problem, I'll get around to that next time I go around the event loop. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I would consider myself an expert uh, at coding badly. But I can take very simple bits of JavaScript and create infinite loops out of them in places I least, least expect. But let's take a closer look at what happens when I do that, uh, here's a page with a GIF and some text, and a big button that runs an infinite JavaScript loop. So if I click that button, everything stops. The GIF has stopped. I can no longer select text. The whole tab has, has kind of come to a standstill. Code for this is simple. This is just button click while true. So how do we actually visualize this? Well, the user clicks the button, so the browser says, hey, event loop, I've got a task for you. The event loop's like, yep, no problem, I'm on it. But this task never ends. It's running JavaScript forever. A couple of milliseconds later, the browser says, hey, event loop, like, um, we need to uh, update that GIF that was on, on the page. So if you could just uh, render at your next earliest convenience, that would be fantastic. And the event loop's like, yeah, OK, I'll get round to that right after I finish this infinite loop that I'm busy doing right now. Then the user tries to highlight text. And that involves like hit testing, it involves looking at the DOM to see what the text actually is. So the browser says, hey, I've got a couple more items for your to-do list there. And the event loop's like, are you having a laugh? Like, do you know how long it takes to perform an infinite loop? It's a long time, you know, there is a clue in the name. So that is why the while loop blocks rendering and for the interaction. But this is a good thing in practice. We look again at the code that I started with. Um, I used to worry that this would result in a flash of content, but it can't. Right? This script runs as part of a task, and that must run to completion before the browser can get back around to the render steps. The event loop guarantees your task will complete before rendering any content. It still brings me out, but I'm always going to be like that for that video. So. so, a while loop blocks rendering, but what about this? So this is a loop, but each time you go around the loop, we're using the next time out to the next form. Let's find out. So, a very similar test to before. I click the button, and things are still working. I think it kind of looks like nothing has changed. But in the background, here's what's happening. We queue a task, go around the event loop, think of that task, and we queue another task as a result. And that just keeps happening and happening until the end of the time. But as we've already seen, right, only one task can be processed at a time. So when it's processed, the task is going to go all the way around the event loop. So well, that means that at some point the browser can say, huh, we should update the, the display for that GIF. And it can, it can go around and update the display. And that's why a set timeout loop is not rendered. But if you want to 
want to run code that has anything to do with rendering, um, a task is really the wrong place to do it, because a task is on the, the opposite side of the world to all of the rendering stuff as far as the event is concerned. What we want to do is we want to run code in the render set, we want to run code here. Uh, rather than let us do that, uh, let us do that using the text animation framework. I don't know if bad in the name of something, but it's really good for this point. Rough callbacks, um, they happen as part of the render set. And to show why this is useful, I'm going to animate a box. Just a box. And it's in this code. So I'm going to move that box forward one pixel, and then use the quest animation frame to create a loop around it. So, that's the quest animation frame. But what if we switch the quest animation frame? It looks like this. Now, this box is moving faster. It's moving about 3.5 times faster. And that means this callback is being called more often. And that is not a good thing. It's not a good thing at all. We saw earlier that the render, uh, rendering can happen in between tasks. Yes. Just because it can happen, doesn't mean it must. In reality, we can take a task. Shall we render? No, I can't be bothered yet. Go around the event, we pick another task. Shall we render now? No, it doesn't feel like the right time. Many tasks can happen and before the browser goes, yeah, actually, next time, we will look at it this way. And the browser gets to decide when to do this, and it tries to be as efficient as possible. The render sets only happen if there's something that's actually worth replacing. If nothing's changed, it won't bother. Like, if the browser tab is in the background, if it isn't visible, it will never run the render set because it's not playing. But also, the majority of screens update at a set frequency, and in most cases, that's 60 times a second. Some screens go faster, some screens go slower, uh, but 60 hertz is the most common. So if we change page valve like a thousand times a second, it's not going to run the render set a thousand times a second. Uh, it will synchronize itself with the display. Oh, that happened already to me, didn't it? I forgot about that. You don't get stuck here. It only renders into a frequency that the player is capable of. Otherwise, it would be a waste of time. Like, it's not like rendering stuff the user will never see. But that's what set time is doing here. It's moving faster because it's updating the position of that box more times than you can see. More times than this display is capable of showing. Also, so far we've been using set time as this kind of shorthand for a few attacks. And it isn't really, because even though we put zero in seconds for the callback, it's more like 4.7 is what the browser will use the default. The spec says the browser can pick any number to use, uh, but in the that test, it's probably about 4.7. There isn't a, a single method that just queues a task, but we can kind of fake it using message channels, and then so I'd like, run a test with that. Um, and if you're sensitive to flashing images, it might be better to look away now, because that looks like this. There's so many tasks happening that it kind of just looks like the box is getting a, a random position. We're getting a task every 200 of a millisecond. So rendering can happen between tasks, but you can have many, even tens of thousands of tasks between renderings. Okay, the question is not now. Let's imagine each of these is a frame that is displayed to the user. So our rendering sets that happen at the start of each frame. And that includes like style calculation, layout, and paint. Not necessarily all free every time, it depends on what I'm doing with paint. I like this. I like this. It's very, it's very neat. This, this is a beautiful thing. Tasks on the other hand. They could be a start. They just kind of appear anywhere they fancy. The event loop ensures that tasks appear, uh, they happen in the right order, they happen in the order that we queued. But in terms of timing within a frame, there is no kind of order in here at all. We saw this with our set timer. Uh, we were getting four per frame, three or four per frame. And that means that three quarters of those callbacks were wasted effort in terms of rendering. All the animation libraries used to do something like this, um, where they were trying to use a millisecond value that's going to give them roughly 60 callbacks per um, second. Uh, and they're assuming a lot about the screen now, they're assuming the screen is 60 hertz, but that wasn't kind of the case. But it kind of worked, it eliminated some of the duplicate effort. Unfortunately, it was a massive hack, because set timeout was not designed for animation, and it really shows. Like, due to inaccuracies, you can end up with drift. So what's happened here is we, we're doing nothing in one frame, and then in the next frame, we're doing twice the amount of work. And that is a visual giant to the user, it's really great. 
Also, if one of your cannons rings wrong, uh, you can end up moving the render steps around because it's all running on the same thread and you're sort of disturbing their, their lovely routine that they have. If we use request animation frame, rather than set timeout, it would look a lot more like this. All the things you need, all the nice things you Everything is within the timing of the frame, even if it's longer than that. When I see like, performance cases like this, it just makes me happy. This, this is showing a good degree of experience. It's very fun. Uh, you can't avoid tasks completely, of course, because um, things like click events are going to be delivered to you as a task, and, and generally you want to respond to those as soon as possible, fair enough. Oh no! So you have things like timers, or you have stuff coming from the network, I really recommend using request animation frame to batch that work together, especially if you already have animation. Okay, push through it, right? It's a lot of to work. Um, I treat tasks like I treat people who okay. drink fizzy water. Like, I acknowledge that they exist, but I keep our interactions to a minimum because I do not trust them at all. I mean, I would consider myself an empathetic person, but I have limits. Like, I, I think soda water is totally disgusting, and I cannot think of a way that a human being could drink fizzy water without gagging or being sick or passing out or something. So what when up? I see someone who does drink fizzy water, I think that's what <laughs> I, I maintain a Twitter list of people who drink fizzy water. It's not a creepy thing, I just, I just want to make sure I know what they're up to and what they're doing. But when I find a link between these people and Brexit and Donald Trump, I'm blowing the case wide open, taking it straight to the FBI. And it pains me to tell you this, J.S. Trump, that this conspiracy goes straight to the top. <laughs> uh, every now and then someone will say to me, like, oh, good shape. you drink Diet Coke, and I think you'll find the main ingredient is fizzy water. <laughs> no, that's different. That's completely different. Like, the main ingredient of air is nitrogen, right? But you would still die if that's all you breathe. So it's more like that. You cannot survive with just water. Ah, request animation frame. Right. There's one more detail I want to get to, and this is something that can catch us a lot of the time without getting big small thing out. Request animation frame is comes before processing the CSS and before painting. So code like this might seem expensive, like we're showing it lighting a box many, many times. But this is actually really cheap. Like JavaScript will always run to completion before rendering happens. So while you're doing this, the browser just sits back and it lets you have your money changing the value and it doesn't really think about it in terms of CSS at all. And then at the end, when it actually comes around to the render set, it goes, right, what did you actually change in the end? And the only did that matter to the final one. And this explains the gotcha in CSS, or at least something that caught me out. I had a thing, right, that I wanted to animate from an exposition of 1,000 to 500. So, I had my listener here, uh, I set the exposition to 1,000, I saw this to transition, and I changed the value to 500. But that animated from 0 to 500, and I'm like, that. come on, bro, this is what? I figured out that maybe I'm giving it too much information to play all at once. Uh, and it's, it's the same reason we saw before, right? The browser's not going to think about it, I'm just it's got one block of JavaScript. Um, so it's going to ignore that first platform value. So I mean, okay, fair enough. What I'll do then is I'm going to put this the second step into that inside the request animation, right? And now it still animates from 0 to 500, and I was like, what is, what is going on here? So I was telling you, I finally figured it out. The user clicks on the button, and that's a task. So we come around to here. And this is where we set the initial transform and the transition. Fine. We do an animation frame, we go around, and this is where we set the destination the final transform value. So the browser doesn't think about CSS until this next step over, the purple block there. This is where it calculates the CSS. So again, it totally misses the first value because it hasn't thought about files in between those two things being set. And that's why to make this work, you need to use not one, but two first animations. Now, this will animate to one more time. What? Incidentally, there is a happy I didn't get that. What? So again, 
again, it totally misses the first value to calculate the CMS. So again, it totally misses the first value because it hasn't thought about styles in between those two things being set. And that's why to make this work, you need to use not one, but two request animation frames. And now this will animate from 1,000 to 500. I don't get it. Incidentally, there's a happy alternative to this. Um, you can use something like get computer style and just access one of the properties on it. And this forces the browser to perform style calculation a lot earlier than it naturally would. Uh, but it makes the browser take note of all the things you set up until that point. So it's like, oh, okay, transform, translate X, 1,000, that's the thing that this element does. Um, but you need to be careful with doing this because you can end up forcing the browser to do a lot of extra style work that makes you really want to do it. Only really want to do that once in a in reality, the best way to deal with this uh, would be the animation API, the web animation API, because you can just say, I want it to go from here to the value and it works. But that's only Chrome, so there's not really what's wrong with that. So, it's a position of request animation okay, frame within the render spec. That was it was unintended to go backwards, but, but um, yeah. Probably not your fault. Uh, you might have been misled by particular implementations because Edge and Safari, they get this very wrong. They put wrap around about here. Um, most notably, they put it after paint. Uh, and that's kind of annoying because it means like, if the user clicks somewhere or something happens and you want to batch that work, you've been using request animation frame, Edge and Safari, they will render before they get to your callback so the user is going to see something. And that means that you're not going to see the actual changes you make until the next frame along, and that's adding quite a significant delay to things appearing on the screen, uh, and it also makes it really difficult to batch work together. I hope this is something to fix soon, it is, there's been activity on the post recently, but the web standards say it should be here, and that's where it is in uh, 5.7 and Chrome. Okay, that's enough about request animation frame. I want to take a look at microtasks. This is probably the least understood part of the event loop, I'd say. Um, I strongly associate microtasks with promises. But this is not where they started. Like, back in the 1990s, browsers wanted to give developers a way to monitor DOM changes. Uh, and the W3C went, OK, we'll sort that out for you. And they gave us mutation events. So this is where I can say, OK, I want to know when a node is inserted into the body element. And fine, excellent. And you get a series of other events. But in practice, this was pretty problematic. Like, we take this bit of code here. What I'm, what I'm doing is I'm adding 100 spans uh, into the, the body element. How many events would you expect to receive as a result of this? One event? One event for the, the whole operation? No. 100 events, one for each span? Yes. But also another 100 for this line here when the content is going into the actual span, a text node is going into the span. And because these events bubble, this simple piece of code is going to land you with 200 events. Uh, and because of this, like relatively simple DOM modifications, ended up triggering, triggering thousands of events. And if you were doing like a tiny bit of work in these listeners, that quickly became a big bit of work and it was a performance disaster. What we really wanted was a way to sort of hear about a batch of this work. And similar to what we saw with styles before, we want the browser to kind of sit back, let us do some stuff, and then at a convenient point say, ah, some stuff changed. Here, here is a kind of a, an event or something to represent all of those changes. We want to hear about it once, not 200 times. And the answer became mutation observers, and they created a new queue called microtasks. Uh, a lot of documentation I read about microtasks suggests that it, it happens like, I don't know, every turn of the event loop, or it, it happens after a task, or something like that. And it, it is kind of true. Um, there is a single place on the event loop where microtasks happen, but that is not where you'll generally encounter it. They also happen whenever the JavaScript, uh, whenever JavaScript finishes executing. Yeah, and that, that means that the JavaScript stack has gone from having stuff in it to having no stuff in it. And that's where we run microtasks. So you can end up with microtasks happening halfway through a task. You can, ha happen, you can have microtasks in the render steps as part of request animation frames. Kind of anywhere. Anywhere JavaScript can run. So that means this JavaScript will run to completion, adding 100 spans and their contents. JavaScript finishes executing, and we get our mutation observer callback. Promises made use of them as well, so here we queue a microtask, and then log yo. JavaScript has finished executing, so we go for the microtasks and we log hey. And that means when a, pro a promise callback is executing, you are guaranteed that no other JavaScript is midway through at the time, 
The promise callback is right at the bottom of the stack, and that's why promises use microtasks. But what happens if we create a loop using microtasks? A bit like we did with set timeout before. Same demo again. Click the button, and it blocks rendering, it blocks the tab. In the same way that a plain while loop is very different from set timeout before. So, promise callbacks are async? Fine. But what does async actually mean? I mean, all it means is that they happen after synchronously executing code, so that's why we get yo before hey. But just being async doesn't mean it must yield to rendering, doesn't mean it must yield to any particular part of the event. We've looked at three different queues so far. Uh, we looked at task queues, uh, animation callback queues, which is where uh, request animation frame callbacks happen, and now we're looking at microtasks. And just to make your lives a little bit easier, uh, they all are processed very subtly differently. Uh, like, like we're seeing with task queues, we take one item and we take one item only, and if another item is queued, it just goes to the end of the queue, fine. Animation callbacks, they happen until completion, except ones that were queued while we were processing animation callbacks. They are deferred to the next frame. Microtasks, on the other hand, they are processed to completion, including any additionally queued items. So if you are adding items to the queue as quickly as you're processing them, you are processing microtasks forever. The event loop cannot continue until that queue has completely emptied. And that is why it blocks rendering. So I get, I get really excited about this stuff. I hope, I hope other people are excited about this as I am. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. One person, excellent. Do you know what, I used to have a real job, right? Like many of you did. Um, this stuff, like the sort of speaking, the standards work, the creating slides, this used to be my hobby, but then my hobby became my job, and now I have no hobbies. I'm a boring person now. And I, and I, didn't, I didn't actually notice when this happened. Like, genuinely, the, only, the first time I noticed is that I went for an eye test, and the optician, just making small talk, asked, and, uh, uh, and, and, and what are your hobbies? Oh, shit. <laughs> Like I say, I, I stress, so I, I got a bit like, oh, I can't, I can't say nothing. Who says nothing? Uh, so I, it's just totally true. I panicked and I said, I um, play the piano. I don't play the piano. <laughs> and then I stressed even more because I thought like she was going to say, oh, well, that's great. We don't need to use the letters chart then. Here's some sheet music. Can you read me the first five bars? What chord is this? Thankfully, she didn't. Uh, but yeah, my optician now thinks I'm pianist. It's great. I don't go back to the opticians anymore. I'm terrified of like more piano chat. I don't know how I survive in the real world. Right. I think you're ready for this next one. Occasionally I run uh, little JavaScript quizzes. Maybe that's my hobby. Nope, that's work too. Never mind. Yes, I run little JavaScript quizzes and this is my favorite question. So I've got a button and on click I resolve the promise and then log something. But I have two event listeners on the same element doing the same thing. So if the user clicks a button, what happens? In which order are things logged? Well, our first listener executes. Great, so that's on the JavaScript stack. Queues a microtask, and then we get to the next line where we log listener one, and that's the first answer. Most folks agree on that bit, but what next? And I ran a Twitter poll on this last week, I've been speaking to a few of you, a few of you saw it. Uh, most people would say the next thing logged is listener2 at 63%. 5% of people think nan is just logged and then infinity. That is not the answer, but fair enough for that 5% of people. But yes, we got 63%. And listener2 is the wrong answer. Um, this is a real gotcha with script. Um, but if you thought it was listener2, then you're in very good company, so don't worry about it. Our listener has finished. So we've gone from having something on the JavaScript stack to nothing. So it is microtask time. We are going to run that promise and we are going to log microtask one. And there we go. And then it's time for the second listener. And that works the same. So the order is listener one, microtask one, listener two, microtask two. But that's if the user clicks the button. What if the button is clicked using JavaScript? Oh yes, it's different. For starters, our script is on the stack. We call click, and that synchronously dispatches the events. So we start with listener one, great. 
We queue a microtask and we log this no one. And now it's microtask time. No, no, it is not microtask time. We can't run microtasks. This is where it's different because our JavaScript stack is not empty. Button.click has not returned yet. So we move on to listener two. We queue another microtask and now we log listener two. And this is where it diverges. And now our listener is done. In fact, all our listeners are done. Button.click returns our JavaScript stack to empties. And now we can process those microtasks and they happen in order. And this has real world implications. Right? So beware if you're using um, like promises in this way, or using or if you're using automated tests as well, because if automated tests, if they're clicking things on the page, they're likely to be using JavaScript to do it, and that can change the behavior of your code. It's I wonder if this can be used to like detect automated uh, bots or something. Uh, I'm pretty sure, right? So um, <coughs> if someone tries to like. Uh, act as a human and uses JavaScript to automate things, so it's like doing some stuff. Um, maybe in this way they can be detected by the, the order of execution, right? Um, yeah, cool. came up when we were looking at how to add observables to the DOM and how they integrate with promises. We hit this question. If we have a, a promise that represents the, the next click of a particular link, it's just this little bit of code here, can someone use that promise and still call event docker event default? Promises are async, so have we missed our chance to prevent the default here? It turns out no, it's fine. It's totally fine. This works. This just works. Unless, again, the user clicks the link, or some code clicks the link using JavaScript. And this is the final puzzle of the talk, so we're running a little bit. Uh, to figure this out, we actually need to take a look at the spec. Uh, so this is a very rough description of how the spec for clicking a link works. Uh, but we start by creating an event object, and then for every listener we have, we invoke that listener with the event object. And then we take a look at that. Has, has that event object's cancel flag been uh, set? If it's been set, then we're not going to follow the hyperlink, but if it's unset, we will follow the hyperlink. When you call event dot event default, it sets this cancel flag on the event object. So if the user clicks a link, that's fine. Our microtasks happen here. After each callback, that's when the JavaScript stack empties. But when we call click with JavaScript, it's just going to call out to our processor link click uh, algorithm. And it only returns once that algorithm is complete. So the JavaScript stack never empties uh, during this algorithm. So our microtasks can't happen. So it hits this step three where it looks at the event object. And it, even if you've got loads of promises trying to call, like event default, it's too late. It's going to follow that hyperlink. And then sometime later, those promise callbacks happen but you've missed the boat. You've missed the point where you can actually cancel that event. So remember that microtasks, they, they, you know, they behave quite differently depending on the JavaScript stack. Okay, so that 34 minutes, that was a massive brain dump of, of everything I know about the event loop and the various uh, steps and various cues. I have found that knowing this stuff, like it, it prevents that case where you kind of got a bit of code that's not doing what you want, so you just wrap it in a set timeout, and now it kind of works sometimes. Just knowing this stuff kind of helps avoid that. It helps me avoid jank by getting stuff running on the correct part of the event loop as well. And I hope I managed to explain this stuff in a way that, that is helpful to you too. Uh, like I said, I'm a stressful person, so as a result of this, I'm now going to go and collapse in a pile. But you've been a great audience. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> Tip off. Um, yeah, what a um, funny dude and an uh, interesting talk. Cool, so that's it for this advertisement episode and um, yeah, see you in the next one. <laughs>